Hey, we're live. Hey, y'all. How y'all doing? I'm a little blurry over here on Facebook. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm a little bit blurry over here on Facebook. But hey, YouTube, IG, I'm live. We are talking about, let me block out some of this side or light rather. Let me block out some of this light. Maybe this will help. I don't know. I don't know, but let's get into it. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Happy new day. We are talking about humble consulting, how to provide real help faster. We've been in this read since last week. We are on chapter four. These chapters are really good because they talk about different case studies and lessons to help us uh, provide real help faster in any arena that we may be in, whether it's public health works, whether you're a lawyer, construction worker, a doctor, an advisor, a coach, whatever your career path, whatever your work, this book can help you. My name is Sabrina J. J. Lewis. <laughs> I am an ambassador of wellness. Here to support your wellness as you're on your journeys, okay? So we are in the fourth chapter, page 75, and I'm excited for us to get into the nitty gritty. Today we're talking about Humble consulting begins with the first conversation, all right? So make sure you have your, your pens, of course, and your highlighters. Let me open it up because you already know. There's going to be some things in here for us to get going on. All right? So we may not get through the whole chapter today, but we're going to go ahead and get as far as we can because there are many lessons. And so we'll probably break this up within two days and so. This is going to be good. Let's go. Building a relationship is a process. It's a process that begins in the initial contact that the helper has with the client. Understanding the importance of the initial response applies to all forms of helping, coaching, and professional counseling. What the doctor or lawyer says in the first very first conversation has the potential of freezing the relationship in level one or beginning to personalize it toward level two. It can apply equally well to the manager meeting, a new employee or a group chair meeting, and a new team member. In this chapter, he says, I explore the various choices that the humble consultant has in her initial response in order to highlight what she could do to begin building the level two relationship. In my experience, most helpful situations or most helping situations that go wrong do so by because of error of omissions or a commission in the very beginning. That was clearly the problem in case two, the engineering lab interviews where I leapt in without giving a question of how to get started at the slightest thought. As the cases below illustrate, the right initial response can not only begin to build the relationship, but can also be paradoxically immediately helpful, as, as was shown in launching the culture process in case one. So there's many case studies that we reviewed prior to this read. And so in humble consulting, there is no exploratory conversation or humble contracting or scouting or diagnosis because your initial response starts a conversation that if it builds the relationship will automatically produce the data you need in order to decide whether or how to get involved. All your energy therefore should go into creating that option, that open, trusting relationship from the, from the moment of first contact. I think maybe I need to put on my glasses. I think so. These glasses are for concentration and I might just need to concentrate. <laughs> so, Here's my glasses. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So how is this to be done? The HC attitude. So HC, we know to be humble consulting. What the helper must bring to the party. Yes, the, these glasses actually are healthy. <laughs> Building a relationship begins with attitudinal preparation. A conscious process of building the right kind of mindset. 
when a when a phone rings and you are about to engage a potential client, you have to be ready in a number of ways, which I am calling the HC attitude, the humble consulting attitude. Think of it in terms of three C's: commitment, curiosity, and caring. That's the AC attitude: commitment, curiosity, and caring. Commitment. You have to be emotionally ready to want to help. Don't pick up the phone or accept a lunch date from a potential client if you are not emotionally prepared to be helpful. If you are responding just to see what might be out there, you're indifferent to showing the tone and pace of your voice, what you actually say, and in your body language if you're meeting face-to-face. So true. It's so true. It's so, so, so true. OMG. Level one professional distance can actually prevent relationship building. Try not to worry about whether this will produce income or not. Let your motive be to see if you can solve the client's problem. If not, you can at least say and do things that will make the client feel really helped right away. Happy new day, y'all. Hey. We're talking about humble consulting. And that it begins in the first conversation. So curiosity, page 77, chapter 4. Curiosity, you have to want to know who is this person and what is the situation. If you are immediately, if you are emotionally prepared but don't have a clue what this will be about, be genuinely curious because that will make you an active, engaged listener from the moment you are in contact with the other person. Don't take the call or go to the meeting if you are not curious to find out what this is all about. If you are busy or preoccupied, don't make the contact. If you are not curious about what goes on there and what others are experiencing and worrying about, get out of the helping business. (laughs) So caring, so we talked about curiosity, right? Talked about curiosity. Now we're going to talk about caring. So caring, you have to get personal as quickly as possible. Focus on the person and what the client to be says to you. It's not about you. It's about the client. Clear your mind as much as possible of preconceptions. It is very difficult not to protect, not to project into a future situation your own expectations based on past experiences with similar situations. It is equally difficult not to focus your listening effort just on those things where you think you can be really helpful. Don't be a hammer just looking for nails. Concentrate instead on actually hearing what the client to be is trying to convey. Okay? In this regard, I have found it helpful not to look up the company, not to look at all the literature that the potential client may have sent you. As tempting as it might be, I want to focus on what the client tells me personally in the here and now. So true, personal experiences, I do that. When people bring me in to consult on different things, dealing with um, wellness, advocacy, healthcare, caring, I don't look at their um, material. I used to. I used to study the whole organization from top to bottom, but I learned that that's facade. You know, what people show you on the outside is usually not what's going on on the inside. So it takes communication and obeying our instincts to get to the point of what they really got going on, right? So in this regard, I have found it helpful. Okay, I read that part already. So doctors, lawyers, and managers have these same choices. The doctor can arrive at the bedside wondering whether this patient will be relevant to his specialty or can he... Or he can get curious about the person and ask, where are you from? Hey, IG. Hey, Facebook. How y'all doing? Hope all is well in your world. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. I see you. I don't see you. Like, I don't know who it is, but like, I know people what's here or are here. All right. Page 77 going into 78. Where are you from? Or he can get curious about the situation and start with, where does it hurt? All right. So. How to listen, you know what? I mean, for my own self, because sometimes I get caught up. Sometimes I get caught up. So let me let me really pay attention to this. Page 78, y'all. 
how to listen. How you listen to the first things that person says provides crucial choices. You have basically three choices, all of which qualify as intense, interested listening, but have different consequences for relationship building. Self-oriented listening. Self-oriented listening. What am I hearing that I can connect to and be helpful on because it taps into my knowledge, experience, and skills? How does what the person says link to my motives, values, and needs? Will it be to my advantage to get involved here or not? Do I have time for this? We're talking about self-oriented listening, how to listen when we're providing real help faster and humble consulting. It is difficult not to start and remain in this mode. We think we can hear both what is relevant to us and what the potential client is talking about. But in my experience, if I am busy evaluating how the potential client's com comment fits into my life space, I am not allowing my curiosity enough scope and will most likely not really hear what the client is after. Ellen Langer's question, what else is going on? Oh, I like that. I mean, I like that. Because I always say, what y'all got going on? <laughs> what y'all got going on? I always say that, right? What else is going on highlights that we are always able to process several aspects of our experience. The issue is what captures our primary attention. Am I curious about what this call means for me? Or am I curious about the person and the situation at the other end of the line? That leads to the second and third choice question. I mean, options. Okay, now we're gonna talk about context, empathetic listening. You may want to focus your listening on what problem, issue, or situation a person is trying to convey to you and what problem elements you or what problem elements should be considered in what the person is trying to convey. This is not the same as content seduction. Where you begin to imagine immediately what you might do if you were in that situation and let your attention wander to those possibilities. Your primary attention, energy, and curiosity stay focused on trying to understand the nuances of the content of the client's situation and whether whatever way he is conveying it. You ignore tone of voice and various cue, cues, cues about the person and try to focus on the situation that the person is trying to convey. For example, the person says, I am really worried about the low level of employee engagement in my organization. If you are content focused, you will ignore that I am really worried and just pay attention to the employee engagement issue. However, you can also choose instead to be person empathetic. Let's talk about person empathetic listening. Page 79, you can focus your listening on how this person is experiencing and feeling about the situation he is describing to you. Here, your primary attention and curiosity are focused on the urgency conveyed in the tone of voice and whatever other cues you have available to decipher what might be going on with this person as he is describing the content of his situation. <clears throat> you may hear anxiety, anger, mm -hmm. anxiety, anger, impatience, relief to be talking to someone about the situation, concerns testiness about having to talk to anyone about this, skepticism about whether any good will come of this and so on. It is your choice whether to give primary attention to these cues as you listen and to focus your primary attention to these cues as you listen and to focus your primary curiosity on the person instead of the situation. The first responses you make will depend on which way you listen. So you should be clear in your mind, in your own mind, what your intentions are and be prepared to adapt quickly 
to what you actually hear if you want to build a relationship. It will be especially important whether you choose to personalize around the content of what you are told or whether you choose to personalize around the person who is telling it. Either one may be helpful, but you won't know until you are in the situation. Hey, y'all. Happy new day. Happy new day. I just want to make sure I show y'all some love, whoever's watching. I'm not able to wave at anybody on Facebook, but thank you for being here. Hey. All right, page 80. Choices of how to respond. Again, you all, I'm here in the mornings so that I can support your journeys. Whatever you got going on, whoever you'll be speaking to today, whoever you'll be helping, I'm hoping that this book will help you to be humble in your consulting and provide real help faster, appropriately. Don't just be saying it in the old thing because you think it sounds good. Sometimes we offend people and don't even know because we're trying so hard when all we have to do is be authentic in our approach. And if your authenticity is offensive, then seek some support. There's so much support out here for us. How to respond. Choices. The initial things you say or do should both encompass honoring the client and provide you necessary information. In other words, your initial responses have multiple purposes. To make the client feel comfortable about having had to ask for help, to get you some more information on what is going on, and to be as sympathetic and empathetic as possible so that even the first few interactions will be felt by the client to have been helpful. I have been amazed how often those first humble inquiry questions, assertions or or revelations, or even just my silent attentiveness proved to be really helpful on the very issue that the client was calling about because they provided at the minimum an opportunity for the client to hear herself, or if you say something, an opportunity, an opportunity to focus, reframe, or provide a different perspective. Authenticity, humble inquiry or reaction. There is an important difference between a pure level one inquiry model, where you just try to get the client to be to figure things out, and HC approach, which is humble consulting approach, where you try to personalize and open a door to level two relationship. Therefore, you must be as open and honest and authentically yourself as is consistent with the situation. You have an important choice here, whether to ask a humble inquiry type of question or to reveal something about yourself or to give in to a reaction you may be having. In my previous writing, I advocated humble inquiry as always the first step, but I found but I have found myself realizing that this does not mean literally to always stick to asking questions, but rather to always convey an attitude of inquiry. Right? And I have to take my own notes. He says, I have found myself realizing that this does not literally mean to always stick to asking questions, but rather to always convey an attitude of inquiry and interest. Paradoxically, that attitude is sometimes best conveyed by saying something personal about yourself or giving in an honest reaction, as I did in case um, case one. That reveals to the client that you have heard him. The only principle is that you should remain committed to being helpful. Okay, so types of questions. What to ask and how to ask it, right? Because sometimes we don't know what questions to ask. When we're in certain situations, sometimes we don't know how to respond. We don't know what to say, we don't know what to ask or or how. So here are the types of questions and what to ask and how to ask. It usually feels most natural to ask some questions, but it is crucial to be aware of how many cho- uh, choices you have as to the type of question you ask initially and the tone of voice you use in how you ask your question. Whether you respond with humble inquiry Essentially saying, tell me more or begin uh, or begin to influence the interaction with more focused questions will, of course, depend on how the client presents himself and the situation. 
In that regard, I have found it useful to distinguish the different kinds of questions you can ask according to their intentions and consequences. I developed a typology of questions early in my consulting career and find it useful to remember my choices before I leap into a response. So in his former books, 1999, 2009, and 2013, the typology is built around the principle that initially the helper has to both make the client feel comfortable and get basic information around ground zero. Hence, it is best to begin with humble inquiry. Humble, humble inquiry is open-ended questions to which you truly do not know the answer. Ask the client, as the client says more, ideas, hypotheses, and insights inevitably form in your head, and you begin to feel the need to focus on what you learn on the issues. You begin to see around the person or the situation that is presented. You may not feel you have an answer, but you will begin to want to ask questions that focus the client to be and therefore take him away from what he might have continued his story into content that you want to know more about to satisfy your curiosity. This category is diagnostic inquiry. Okay, diagnostic inquiry. It's a broad category of questions that can vary as little as huh, or say that again, or help me to understand this to a point in why did that happen? Or why did, or what did you do then? Or how did that make you feel? What diagnostic questions have in common is that they influence the client's story. They force the client off her track in telling it. They alter the process by which the client chooses to reveal her, uh, herself. I call these diagnostic questions because they are designed to help both you and the client to begin to understand the situation of herself a bit better. If I sense that the client has much more to tell me on her own terms, I certainly will let her do that. But when either my need for specifics or her need to pause and get a reaction creates a break in, in the flow, I will ask a diagnostic question knowing full well that I am now taking, taking charge of the conversation to a certain degree. By shifting from just listening attentively to appearing in the conversation as a person with my own interests, I have made it into the conversation rather than one person just telling another person's story. Until I depart from humble inquiry, I am just an unknown entity in the conversation, little more than an interested listener. With a diagnostic question, I become a person with a point of view and have thereby begin, begun to build a relationship in a certain direction. Diagnostic questions can be differentiated into three types. Conceptual, emotional, and behavioral. The conceptual is the basic question, why? Conceptual is why which forces the client to think about and examine various aspects of what he has just told me and to think about what uh, the causes. Why didn't you get vaccinated? Why did you get vaccinated? How did it make you feel? Well, actually, no, that's why. <laughs> now we're getting to the emotional, the basic question, how? How's that, uh, how does that make you feel? In reference to some event that the client has just talked about. Behavioral, the basic question, what did you do? What did you do in reference to some choice points in the client's story? So these three types of questions can also be linked to a time horizon. What did you do? What can you do? Or what will you do? Or what did you feel? What do you feel about this now? How will you feel about this in the future? Circular questions and process focus. Let's get into it. Page 83. If the goal of your question is to help the client to see their embeddedness in a complex situation or system, to think more deeply about what may be going on in the story she is telling, you can ask each of these types of questions in a form that family therapists call circular questions. In a circular question, you ask the client to speculate on how others 
any assist that might be thinking, feeling, or behaving. Happy new day, y'all. The most common occasion for this type of question in my experience is when a client asks me to visit her organization to interview her subordinates or take some other action that I am not comfortable with. I am then inclined to ask her, if I show up and go ahead and do that, what do you think their reaction would be? By that question, I am asking the client to consider the possible consequences of what she proposed and to test for myself how much the client-to-be understands that everything the consultant does is an intervention with consequences. Again, we are talking about humble consulting and how to provide real help faster. We're learning that humble consulting begins with the first conversation. Depending on what the client-to-be says, we can then explore what she would announce, how she would announce my arrival when she would tell the subordinates Wait, what she should tell the subordinates is the purpose of her bringing me in, how she would deal with the information gathered, and what her longer range plan might be. This kind of questioning also begins to focus our conversation on process issues, how things are being proposed to be done, which in my experience will often turn out to be where the client needs help the most. We'll see more about that in chapter six. So case one illustrates how I proposed immediately that the work, the client visit, no, wait, 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 let me go back. Case one illustrates how I proposed immediately that the client visit me, right, instead of my visiting them, as this worked well. In case two, the engineering interviews my colleague and I just showed up and did our interviews without any consideration of how this might impact the lab, and that worked out poorly. Diagnostic questions change the course of the conversation and invite the client to consider some other elements of her story, but they do not introduce new content into the conversation. When questions do introduce new content, I think of them as suggestive questions. In previous work, I called the I called these confrontative because they force the client to look at new information that she may have never considered, but the HC attitude does not really ever condone what is implied in, con in confrontation. So I feel suggestive is a more accurate word in terms of what it connotes. HC again is humble consulting. Let me just wave at everybody that came on IG. Thank you all for joining. Hey, Facebook, who all, all who are currently watching me who I can't see, thank you for being present. Suggestive inquiry. And we're going to bring this call to an end close soon. So as a conversation with the client begins, we inevitably experience moments when our own ideas, feelings, suggestions for, for action pop into our heads. And we have to decide whether or not to reveal those thoughts. With a diagnostic question influences the direction of how the client tells his story. The suggestive questions forces new content into the story, content that did not come out of the client's head. The big question, page 85, about this type of intervention is when to do it, knowing that you are asking the client to think about something that he had not considered initially and, not, and, and knowing that most dangerous aspect of being the helper is to give premature advice, right? That's why we always say, we will work on it and we will do our best to achieve an outcome, but we never can give a promise, right? Because we don't know how it's going to go. So knowing that you are asking the client to think about something that he had not considered initially and knowing that the most dangerous aspect of being a helper is to give premature advice. A doctor is not going to give you a diagnosis if he does if he has no scientific or physical evidence of that being asked for diagnosis. Let me just take my notes. And so the dangerous aspect again of being the helper is to give premature advice and thereby to undermine your own credibility. The trap for the helper is that the client has had considered it ruled it out for various good reasons and now wonders why the consultant has come up with such a bad idea. 
There is nothing more discouraging when you are trying to build up a relationship than to have the client say, I already tried that. It doesn't work. With implication, how come you, the consultant, don't see all the flaws in what you have suggested? Putting the suggestion or idea into question form helps somewhat. So you can soften the tone if you are unsure. What really works is the recommendation that the consultant has worked out on her own after a period of so-called data gathering, as the MAC project with DEC showed dramatically in case three. What works better is to wait with the suggestive question until you feel that a level two working relationship has been achieved to some degree and you feel that the client trusts you. Once I feel that the client and I trust each other at the working level, that will be honest and open with each other on task related matters. I feel completely comfortable in saying things like, did that not make you feel angry? Or why did you withdraw instead of confronting the situation? Or in the future, do you think you could go talk to the person? Or as we see in cases five and six, have you considered that, that, that? Something different than what the client's story had revealed or what the client proposed. Let's get into process-oriented inquiry. Process-oriented questions come in three forms. Redirecting how the client is formulating her analysis of the problem. Redirecting what the client wants you to do in the helping process and or focusing on the interaction with the client in the here and now. In the cases I discussed below and elaborate and elaborate on in chapter six, I redirected both the how the client formulated the problem and what she wanted me to do to help her. Questions that focus on interpersonal process that is occurring between a client and you in the here and now are likely to be less frequent, but are always available if you are not comfortable with how the conversation is going. As we look ahead to developing adaptive moves in complex, messy situations, redirecting the conversation and using more dialogic formats may become more necessary. As I show in chapter seven, the purpose of such here and now questions is to make both parties aware that they are in a relationship building process and the process it is itself subject to analysis and review, hello. I think people forget that when they ask you for help, you're analyzing and reviewing their subject, what they have going on. You're building a relationship. It's a process. It's a process. So in your conversation with the client, you can always say, how is this going? Am I being helpful? Is there something else I should be doing or asking you about? Are we okay? Or, simil or something similar. That was process-oriented inquiry. Now we're gonna talk about personal revelation or revelation rather. So first the HC attitude. HC again is humble consulting. The HC attitude requires authenticity. You cannot fake it or evolve a role that hides your reactions. Let's revisit the dilemma of you wanting to use humble inquiry to stay in a questioning mode in order to learn as much as you can about what is on the client's mind. But now you have a strong reaction to something the client to be says in the opening. Should you voice it? I have found that the key here is whether you are reacting from a position of curiosity or and or empathy, or whether you are reacting from self-orientation. Revealing something of your own personal reaction is clearly an invitation to get more personal. But if it occurs either because of self-orientation or before you have a sense of what is really going on in the client's mind, it has the danger of sending you down a diagnostic track. That is your choice. Not a choice that reflects what is really on the other person's mind. I would therefore be particularly cautious in revealing my actions, my reactions, unless I felt that hiding it would be authentic, unauthentic. Second, you have to continue to play within the cultural rules of what is or is not appropriate to share. I may be upset by the kind of voice the caller has and know that it is inappropriate to share that reaction, but I may also be upset by the condescending tone of voice he is using and feel inappropriate to find a way to voice that reaction. My blurting out in case one, what did you do? 
was technically a question, but what really felt, but was really felt by all of us to be a helpful reaction because it showed commitment, curiosity, and caring. So tomorrow we're gonna to resume with illustrative cases and we're gonna discuss case five, reframing whether to develop a culture analysis template. And we're gonna go into the case study. And then once again, we're gonna talk about the outcomes and the lessons. And then we're gonna get into another case study, case study six, and we're gonna get further into how to begin personalizing, personalizing immediately in a group situation, which is really cool because many of us work in group dynamics. And so that will be more on tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> and so let me just put a mark here. Page 87, we will resume tomorrow. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for listening. I hope that this has helped you. I felt like committing to being here, reading this book with you all will help me to get through it. This is um, one of my book reads for the beginning of the year um, to help with business, personal development, and organizational management. And I know that by me being here, reading this book to you all, it will help us all. All right. So that's my time, you all. Thank you so much again for joining. Have a wonderful day. If you have not already, you can purchase. Um, I participated in two anthologies. One is called Take the Cape Off Sis. The other is It's Your Time Sis. And anyone can purchase it at sabrinajlewis.com. All right. That's my time, y'all. Love life well and live. Bye for now. If you haven't, get your book and join me tomorrow morning at 8.30. See you later.